Audio Lecture of World History Unit 5, The Renaissance, Reformation, and the Age of Exploration. So we start with the Renaissance period. Renaissance means rebirth. So the Renaissance, as I said, means rebirth. <clears throat> and it's a rebirth of the classical period um, of history. Uh, it's when the people of Europe became more and more um, interested in looking back to their past to see how it could influence their future. Uh, and they looked back to the classical Greek and Roman past primarily. So the Renaissance rebirth was a golden age of arts and literature in Europe based on that renewed interest in Greco-Roman culture. Now the Renaissance began in Italy largely due to the wealth of the Italian city-states, places like Venice, Genoa, and Florence. All of these states plus others benefited from renewed trade that was going on in Europe now since the Crusades had happened. Now it's important to remember that these city-states were just that. Italy was not united as one kingdom or even one nation. Instead, each of these city-states were self-governing their own little states. Some of them, like Florence, were ruled by a republic of oligarchs. Um, some were like Venice, ruled by a duke. It was called the Duchy of Venice. And others, like the Kingdom of Naples, as we'll talk about later, uh, was actually a mini kingdom in and of itself. Many of these states were in um, a lot of competition with each other, economically to control the trade coming from the Eastern world into the West through the Mediterranean Sea. This is why Italy, the Italian city states, became so important because they were the middlemen for all of the trade going between the Eastern world and Western Europe. They competed with each other for this business. They also competed with each other for the best scholars of Greek and Roman scholarship that were fleeing westward as the Byzantine Empire continued to crumble under the pressure of the Ottoman Empire. If you look at this map here, you will see the different city-states that Italy was divided into. Italy will not be one united nation until the 1860s, which we'll talk about much later in this course. Genoa, of course, you see there. Venice, you see there and Florence, you see there, were some of the three main ones in Northern Italy that were uh, big movers and shakers, I guess you would say, during the Renaissance period. In particular, Florence. Florence will become the epicenter of the Renaissance. What we also note during the Renaissance, especially in Italy, is that because trade was so important, wealthy merchants and bankers competed with each other for that economic and political power in those city-states. This, of course, was another reason why conflict among the city-states was common. They were in competition with each other for business coming from the East into Western Europe. By the 1400s, wealthy Italians became patrons of the arts as well. Instead of like we saw during the medieval period where the church was the primary um, patron of the arts, <clears throat> we see now that these upper middle class families, they are not even traditional nobles that we would see during the Middle Ages. These were upper middle class families. They were um, merchants, uh, bankers, they become the patrons of the art. They want to uh, present themselves as these patrons, as, a, as that important in society. And uh, they're seeking to glorify themselves and their families and also their city state. This is a big shift. Another characteristic of the Renaissance is the shifting in the patronage of the arts, diminishing um, as much patronage 
uh, of the church as we had seen during the Middle Ages, and it's shifting more to a secular focus um, with the middle class being the patrons. Now, this does not mean that there were not still religious um, themed art. We do see a lot of portraits and things of families, but we also see some religious um, imagery as well. The one that you see on the right is actually a Renaissance dressed woman. She's dressed like a Renaissance woman, but it is actually a picture of Judith and the Holofernes, which is from the Bible, Judith having cut off the head of Holofernes. So it's interesting if you think about it, they put in modern ideas and mixed in some of the um, old uh, themes from the um, the, the biblical texts, but you also will see similar things with ancient Greek and Roman themes as well. Renaissance styling, um, you know, with combined with classical themes. The Medici family of Florence, where the Renaissance really starts, began to dominate European banking and they were famous patrons of the arts. Now, they were a banking family. They started in, in Florence, which was a republic, but they had um, banks all over Europe. They became important bankers to many wealthy noble families throughout Europe, as well as many royal families throughout Europe. During the Renaissance, many kings in Northern Europe were trying to solidify their power and take power away from the um, noble classes who had had a lot of power under the feudal system um, during the Middle Ages. So one of the ways that they would try to wrench power away from those nobles and gain more for themselves is to not be dependent upon the nobles to build up their armies. Um, under the feudal system, the nobles were in charge of the armed forces. So instead, these kings, they called them new monarchs, started to build up their own large armies full of foot soldiers and they would basically uh, borrow money from these banks like the Medici family controlled in order to be able to not be dependent upon the nobles uh, to fill those armies. So they would have foot soldiers and um, they would become more powerful because if you can control your armies, you can um, control your destiny. The Renaissance interest in Greco-Roman culture led to the embrace of humanism, individualism, and secularism. Now, humanism, individualism, and secularism are all isms, meaning they end in ISM, that we're gonna talk a lot about during the Renaissance. They are basically are three of the major characteristics of the Renaissance period. And the, the interest in the past uh, especially the Greco-Roman past, led to this. So you see a shift away from the piety um, of the Middle Ages, where the Roman Catholic Church had so much of a stranglehold over the consciousness of all European peoples because they had so much power. Um, we know that there had been some, you know, problems with the Roman Catholic Church, some abuses and some, I guess you would say, PR problems with the Roman Catholic Church that had caused it to lose some of its clout by the time we get into the 1400s and especially by the 1500s. We're leading up to a big break with the Roman Catholic Church known as the Protestant Reformation. But before we get there, we go through this period where people start to say, you know, maybe we can't trust the religious figures as much. We need to look to the past in Greco-Roman past prior to, you know, the rise of the Roman Catholic Church to see what they did to try to improve themselves improve, and improve their societies. So this led to a more secular focus, focusing on the human being and the, the accomplishments of a human being, recognizing human beings as glorious creatures and as being able to... Um, to think for themselves and ultimately control their own destiny. Um, this more human focus was not necessarily atheistic, however. Most everybody was still very staunchly religious, 
but they were less clerical. They were not as dependent upon the Roman Catholic authorities uh, to tell them how to behave, to tell them what to do. Instead, they were looking back to the ancient Greek and Roman past for answers, how they can make their world right now a better place rather than just focusing on the afterlife. So humanists, as we call them, uh, Renaissance thinkers, if you will, they stress the capabilities of human reason and the individual accomplishment. They studied Greek classics to better understand humans and humanity, to better understand themselves, they thought, and to better understand how they can create a better world here in this temporal world without just looking to the future um, in the afterlife. They wanted to, they basically saw themselves as glorious creatures because God created them that way. God created man in his image. God created man to be the master of all the other creatures on the earth. Therefore, God must want us to use this reason that he gave us above all the other beasts in order to make this world a better place. Now, Renaissance artists, using that same idea, you see humanism reflected in the arts um, of the Renaissance. They focused on secular as well as spiritual subjects, like I said before. Now, medieval art was primarily religious. You can look here and see medieval art. It is a Madonna and child, um, which is, of course, the Madonna, meaning the mother of Christ with the baby, the baby Jesus. And then, of course, the three kings bringing the gifts to the Christ child. Now, when you look at medieval art here, you see it's very um, static, it's very flat, doesn't have a lot of dimension to it, and um, the people do not show a lot of emotion um, on their faces. Even the baby Jesus doesn't really look like a baby, he looks like a little man. It'll be different with, during the Renaissance. You'll see more human traits and um, emotions and uh, a lot more um, depth with perception and perspective and those kinds of things added. Okay, artists relied on Greco-Roman artistic styles like symmetry, meaning the wanting things to be balanced. What you see on one side you balance it with what's on the other side rather than making um, everything all on one side or the other. But as I said before, Renaissance artists were also responsible for developing perspective, which is the illusion of depth. Now, perspective is also sometimes referred to as linear perspective, creating depth in a painting. It makes your eye go inward. The way the, the objects are placed, the way that the um, objects in the background look smaller than those in the foreground that are larger gives the illusion of depth. And that was one of the um, innovations that came out of the Renaissance. You also see another innovation called chiaroscuro, which is subtle shading to also give depth to the figures. Um, you see in particular in this painting on the left, this is a um, Leonardo da Vinci painting, and you see it's a Madonna and child. Uh, looks a lot different than the previous Madonna that we saw on the previous screen, okay? Uh, first of all, Mary looks like a, you know, very, you know, beautiful Renaissance woman um, with the high forehead that you see a lot in the Renaissance era. But she's acting like a normal woman. She's not just very static. You see the depth to her. You also see the baby Jesus um, uh, down in the foreground, uh, blessing the other child that is to the right of Mary, to her on her right, which is supposed to be seen as the um, as the um, John the Baptist, and you see an angel pointing as well. So the angel is pointing to John because John came first. Then John is kneeling and praying towards the, the Christ child, the baby Jesus, who looks like a big fat baby, you know, which is, looks like a baby, not like a little man, who is blessing his cousin with his two fingers, like a priest would bless somebody making the sign of the cross. Now, you also look at this painting on the right, and you see this is a crucifix. 
Now this crucifix shows you perspective, first of all. It also shows you some of the humanism showing the Christ um, with his head bowed, um, with his body broken, rather than it being static and not showing you um, those kinds of human um, frailties, even if you will. Uh, this humanism showed in these religious figures made people actually feel closer to um, these religious figures because they didn't see them as some kind of out of out of reach um, um, figure. They actually saw them, the human qualities that these people had, and it made them feel a kind of kinship with them. It says, I once was what now you are, and what I am you shall yet be, from the Bible. In the late 1400s and early 1500s, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael represent the peak of Renaissance artistic achievement. They would all be seen as Renaissance men, multi-talented, they didn't just work in one medium. They were uh, important when it came to studying the, um, the history behind the figures that they were representing. Um, Michelangelo, of course, known for sculpture as well as for painting. Leonardo da Vinci, known for painting as well as inventing things. Um, and Raphael, of course, some of the most beautiful paintings that uh, um, uh, were ever created. Leonardo da Vinci with painting. This is the La Gioconda, which we also know as the Mona Lisa, probably one of his most famous paintings. Here is his Last Supper, another one of his most famous paintings with, of course, the symmetry um, from the old Greek and Roman world uh, incorporated with the use of perspective. Of course, at the moment that Jesus declares that someone will betray him, and the, uh, the emotion on the faces as each of the disciples ask, Lord, it can't be. Is it me? Is it me? Is Michelangelo, and that is how you pronounce it, Michelangelo, uh, with his sculpture. Of course, the David is probably his most famous of all sculptures, um, a ginormous 13-foot sculpture that is on top of a... Um, six or eight foot uh, pedestal at the bottom. So it's ginormous. Uh, it was originally meant to be on top of a cathedral. Uh, so there's some um, foreshortening that was done. Um, his hand, his right hand looks rather large. Um, but since it was supposed to be looked at from the bottom, it makes sense that that would be seem larger with perspective. But um, also, of course, many argue that the reason why the right hand of David is large is because it's representing the hand of God that is about to throw the stone that will kill Goliath. Here's another Michelangelo, the Pieta. That's, of course, Mary holding the dead Christ after he came off of the cross. Michelangelo's contract claimed that it would be, quote, the most beautiful work in marble that Rome has ever seen. And here it's coming into focus. And you see how beautiful it indeed it is. Michelangelo also painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling. You see the Sistine Chapel here. The ceiling, of course, is up underneath that roof. And here we go. There it is, okay? The Sistine Chapel ceiling that has the creation of man in the middle and many scenes from the Old Testament all around. It is a glorious thing to behold, truly. If you ever get to Rome, you must go to the Sistine Chapel and see this. Michelangelo also painted the Last Judgment, which is the altarpiece in the Sistine Chapel as well. You can see here many images from the New Testament, those being um, condemned as well as those being raised aloft. Cardinal Baggio de Senza said, 
it was disgraceful that in so sacred a place there should have been depicted all those nude figures exposing themselves so shamefully and that it was no work for a papal chapel but rather for the public baths and taverns. You see what Michelangelo did was he copied a lot of what the classical Greeks had done with their paintings and sculptures, painting them in the nude. And this was shocking to the people of the Renaissance. They had not seen nudity in art portrayed like this for centuries. And so it was scandalous when it first came out. So uh, eventually all, a lot of his nude figures had to be covered over a little bit with loincloths, as you see, placed in um, particularly, uh, you know, important places. <clears throat> Here's some of those that are being damned. Raphael, of course, was known for his Madonnas, his beautiful Madonnas. This is called the Cowper Madonna. And you see, again, another example of how the um, baby Jesus looks like a baby, he does not look like a little man. Um, he's doing baby-like things. He's tugging at his mama. He's trying to climb, you know, higher up into her arms. Raphael also did the School of Athens, which is probably one of the most famous paintings in the Vatican in um, Rome. It's called the School of Athens because, of course, it incorporates a lot of uh, folks and images from the ancient Greek world. Um, you have, of course, um, Aristotle and Plato in the center. And then Raphael also incorporated some modern day, at least his modern day, Renaissance era people in the painting as well, incorporating both the, you know, the modern day and the classical era in his paintings. Of course, you see also perspective, linear perspective, as well as chiaroscuro with the shading as well. During the High Renaissance, the Catholic Church became a major patron of the art again, okay? Uh, they felt they, they had to compete now, you know, they didn't have to compete before with the, um, you know, the merchant class, the upper middle class, but now they do. So during the High Renaissance, which is more as we move into um, the late 1400s and early 1500s, the Catholic Church became a major patron of the arts once again. Rome, the city of Rome, will, in the 1500s, replace Florence as the center of artistic activity, once again. I mentioned the competition that many of those city-states have, so that should not be surprising. Um, when you look at Greco-Roman architecture, Okay, you see the Parthenon in Athens and the Pantheon in Rome. Parthenon in Athens was produced during the Greek, the Greek time period, classical Greek time period. The Pantheon in Rome produced during the, of course, um, classical Roman time period. You see the influences that it will have on the uh, Renaissance architecture. Renaissance architects broke from the medieval Gothic style, which were the tall spires of their cathedrals, etc., and instead started to mimic the old classical style, styles, featuring white marble, triumphal arches, columns, and of course, domes. You see, this is Gothic architecture from the medieval period, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, okay, with the spires and the flying buttresses, and you see here, Renaissance architecture, St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, looks more like a classical Greco-Roman church than a medieval church. In the 1500s, Renaissance creativity started to spread out of Italy, moving northward into the rest of Europe. Northern humanists incorporated more elements of Christianity, however, than Italians. Sometimes we refer to the Italian Renaissance as focusing more on classical humanism, meaning looking back to the classical Greek and Roman past for answers. And in Northern, the Northern Renaissance, meaning in Northern Europe, they focus more on what's called Christian humanism. They're looking back to the original Christian texts for answers. Not so much looking to the clergy for answers, but looking instead to the original 
texts of the um, Old Testament and the New Testament as they were written um, in the original languages, not in translations that the Roman Catholic Church used. Literature flourished during the Northern Renaissance. Most authors chose the vernacular to write in over Latin or Greek. Now the word vernacular means the common spoken language of a given people. So we start seeing people, for example, in Germany start to write in German rather than writing in Latin or Greek, which had been seen as the only um, languages that, you know, that scholarship could be based upon. That changed in the Renaissance. Instead of having to, you know, write only in Latin or Greek to be considered good scholarship, the vernacular languages are starting to become more and more important in literature. And this is going to eventually create even more national languages as a result. In 1456, probably one of the most important inventions in, I guess you would say in modern history, was the invention by Johann Gutenberg who invented the movable type printing press, okay? This was invented in Germany. Now, Germany was not a United Kingdom either. There were many different German principalities. So it was invented in, in um, this area, uh, but it, was, it helped to produce, have faster production of books and eventually leading to higher literacy rates in Europe. Movable type, where you can print multiple pages of one page, rather than having to hand copy each and every page. Here's a um, view of a printing press. And then you could change the type and print as many pages of the next page. And then you could change the type and print as many pages of the other page. This led to more books being produced. This led to, um, it was cheaper to produce these books. So the price would go down and this will eventually lead to more people being able to get their hands on these books and be able to learn to read. And this is another reason why the vernacular languages became so popular in these new writings because people wanted to learn to read in the language that they actually spoke, not in a dead language like Latin that was only really spoken in church. Now Greek was not a dead language, but it was more Eastern. So many of these Europeans are wanting to learn how to read in their own spoken languages. That makes sense. The printing press had revolutionary effects throughout Europe. It helped in the spread of information more quickly. It helped in promoting the freedom of expression. And we're going to see more and more how people are going to start using their reason and um, trying to express themselves in writing more and eventually this will lead to challenges between different uh, groups of people, different classes of people, even challenges to political authorities or to religious authorities. The challenging the power of established authorities to control divergent ideas also is all part of this. And this is why the printing press is really one of the biggest influences and in why the Protestant Reformation happens about a generation after, by 1517, the printing press allowed for the ideas of Martin Luther and other Protestant reformers to spread. Whereas prior to that date, earlier movements by people like John Wycliffe or Jan Hus, who might have spoken out against um, the abuses in the Roman Catholic Church, because the printing press had not been invented yet, their movements were able to be squashed and silenced. But once the printing press came about, it was hard for the Roman Catholic Church to keep a lid on these Protestant reformers who were trying to make changes. There has been discovered in Germany a wonderful new method for the production of books. This is talking about the printing press. And those who have mastered the art are taking it from mains out into the world. The light of this discovery will spread from Germany to all parts of the earth. This will also lead to the flowering of literature, as I said before. 
um, William Shakespeare is probably one of the most famous of all Renaissance, um, Northern Renaissance uh, literary figures. He wrote many plays, as we know. You're going to be reading some of them as you go through school. Uh, also, you look at, uh, he was from England, of course. You look at another individual named Miguel Cervantes on the left, who wrote, it was from Spain, and he wrote Don Quixote, one of the you know, a probably most famous books ever written um, during that time period. Authors primarily were concerned in the case of both of these men with secular life rather than religious life in the themes of their stories. Again, that secular focus, that humanistic focus, which is a trait of the Renaissance. Renaissance philosophers studied the classics as well. They sought insight on human nature, business, and politics. By 1511, a man named Erasmus wrote a book called The Praise of Folly. Now, he was a northern humanist, um, a Christian humanist. He wrote this book, The Praise of Folly, that mocked the immorality and the hypocrisy of many of the Roman Catholic Church leaders who were proven to be corrupt. Um, he was, however, also poking fun at uneducated Christians who lived in superstition. And he used this book as a kind of satire, kind of poking fun at the abuses of the church not because he himself wanted to break ties with the church and start the Protestant Reformation. Actually, he wanted exactly the opposite. He wanted his works to kind of be a slap in the face to the religious authorities in the Roman Catholic Church, causing them to wake up, smell the coffee, if you will, and, and make changes and clean up those abuses. It will not have that effect, however. Instead, Erasmus, even though he never intended it, his ideas will actually foster others like Martin Luther to come along a few years later and finally break ties with the Roman Catholic Church. All Christian religion seems to have a kind of alliance with folly, he argued in his book, Praise of Folly. If you expect proofs, consider first that boys, old men, women, and fools are more delighted with religious things than others. In the next place, you see that the founders of it were plain, simple persons and bitter enemies of learning. Lastly, there are no sort of fools worse than those for whom the zeal of Christian religion has once swallowed up, so that they waste their estates, neglect injuries, suffer themselves to be cheated, put no difference between friends and enemies, abhor pleasure, are crammed with poverty, loathe life, and wish death above all things. In short, they seem senseless to common understanding, as if their minds lived elsewhere and not in their own bodies. Now, Niccolo Machiavelli is another Renaissance writer uh, who shows you the secularism, how that has become more important. We'll talk more about Machiavelli in class. But it's important to know that he wrote his probably preeminent work called The Prince in 1513. In this book, he tried to write it as a, an advice book uh, for how to become the best ruler that you could. He advised rulers to use ruthless, pragmatic leadership to achieve their goals. The stability of the state was the most important thing. Uh, that had to come first. And if it would, if you could achieve that through perhaps killing a few people that needed to be killed that were standing in your way, then you could do that. The whole concept of the end justifies the means comes out of this. Here is a quote. A wise prince should not keep his promise when it is against his interest to do so, and when his reasons for making the promise are no longer useful. If all men were good, this would be a bad guideline, but since they are not good or they are evil and would not keep a promise to you, then you need not keep yours to them. Thomas More, 1516, 
is the last uh, one that we're going to talk about here. We'll talk more in class about him as well. He took the opposite approach that Machiavelli did. Instead, he wrote a book called Utopia, where he argued that reform of social institutions could actually reduce or eliminate corruption and war. Utopia was supposed to be a perfect place where nobody was oppressed politically, economically, or socially. But the word itself, utopia, is Latin for no place. The Commercial Revolution Trade in spices, precious metals, sugar, and slaves brought great wealth to European trading nations. All of this trade was not new during this period, but it picked up after the Crusades because increased contact between the East and the West allowed for that to happen. Wealth supported increased investment and a wide array of new economic ventures. This is what precipitated what is known as the Commercial Revolution. The commercial revolution diminished the economic might of the guilds that were left over from the Middle Ages and saw merchants and bankers emerging as successful entrepreneurs. The guilds had been able to fix prices so that uh, supply and demand did not determine the marketplace and how much money could be made in the marketplace. However, that will be diminished in the commercial revolution and instead the merchants and bankers with supply and demand will help to determine the marketplace. This is of course the beginning or the birth of capitalism. The putting out system will allow merchants to circumvent strict guild regulations and this will lead to dramatic increases in production. What the putting out system was, was where a merchant would buy the bulk, in bulk, a uh, raw material, say wool. Then he would put out in a certain amount of it to a cottage industry, a home industry, to a person who had a spinning wheel, let's say, who would spin that wool into thread. And then that thread would be taken to another cottage industry, another home that had a uh, weaver or a loom, if you will, and they would weave that thread into cloth. Then that cloth would be taken by the merchant after he paid a wage to both the person who created the thread and the one who wove the cloth. That uh, bulk fabric or textile would be taken to market and be sold for a profit. This would allow for a profit to be made for the person who did, who started the putting out system, the merchant. With the putting out system, the entrepreneurs provided cloth and looms to rural families through these cottage industries. And thus, the early industrial movement will be born. Now, we're not talking factory system yet but we are talking an early industrial revolution with cottage industry. International trade and colonization will require great amounts of capital. The English and the Dutch merchants formed joint stock companies in order to fund expeditions to new places to get access to trade routes for raw materials and to trade their goods. We'll talk more about this in the Age of Exploration lecture in Unit 10. Governments used mercantilist systems to create self-sufficiency used tariffs to protect against foreign competition and expanded trade. Now mercantilism is an economic system where the government has strict control over the economy. This means that instead of the supply and demand determining the marketplace, instead the government determines what products will be produced and what prices will be charged. This will allow for some of those kings that are trying to create centralized governments and break the back of the feudal system 
to be able to create strong monarchies. This is one of the things, mercantilism that is, is one of the things that will help to lead to the creation of absolute monarchies. Again, we'll talk more about this as we move into future units. Capitalism will expand as a result of this commercial revolution. Capitalism is an economic system in which capital or wealth is invested to produce more wealth. You got to spend money to make money. Capitalism was based on the private ownership of property. Property can mean land, but it can also mean raw materials or equipment that is used to create a product. This means that merchants were now considered property owners. Instead of it just being the traditional landed aristocracy, these up and coming middle class merchants who own businesses are now considered property owners as well. Capitalists, or those middle class merchants, were motivated by a desire to earn profits, taking advantage of the free market and free enterprise system. This will be expanded more as we enter the 17th and 18th centuries. As capitalism expanded, so did the entrepreneurial class, which is a middle class, which we sometimes refer to as the bourgeoisie. This is a French word that refers to the middle class merchants who are making a way for themselves in business. Business is their way of making money and their business is their property. Now the Protestant Reformation is also a byproduct of this Renaissance era. The Protestant Reformation ultimately challenged the authority and teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And this was caused by centuries of problems in the Roman Catholic Church. The corruptions and the humiliations that the Roman Catholic Church had suffered throughout the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries. This image shows a priest surrounded by demons, none of which are able to touch his body. The image suggests the incorruptible nature of the church in a sinful world. This was an idea that the Roman Catholic Church liked to perpetuate during this time period to keep themselves in a position of power. We will see a definite shift away from this with the Protestant Reformation. Some questioned the behavior of clergy and had been questioning this, as we know, for quite some time. There were some clergy who were completely immoral. They were greedy. They had the desire for political power. Simony was also a problem. Simony is the buying and selling of church positions. Nepotism was also a problem. We saw popes giving big church positions to members of their family. Absenteeism was another problem, meaning that there were some people in positions of power, like bishops, that never actually were uh, in residence in the place where they were supposed to be a bishop. We also see pluralism. Pluralism is where more than one person holds an office in the church hierarchy, or also one person holding more than one high-ranking office in the Roman Catholic Church. The whole day is spent in filthy talk. Their whole time is given to play and gluttony. They neither fear nor love God. They have no thought of the life to come, preferring their fleshy lusts to the needs of the soul. They scorn the vow of poverty, know not that of chastity, revile that of obedience. The smoke of their vents differ little from public brothels. 
This was a writing by Abbot Johannes Trethmus, Trethmus, who wrote about the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church at the dawn of the Renaissance era. Archbishop John Morton wrote, The country's monks lead a life of lasciviousness, nay, of defiling the holy places, even the very churches of God, by infamous intercourse with nuns. The Bishop of Torcello wrote, The morals of the clergy are corrupt. They have become an offense to the laity. So there was trouble. There were events throughout the late Middle Ages that shook people's confidence in the church. We discussed these in previous units. We had the Babylonian captivity, and we had the Second Great Schism. We also know that in Italy, a uh, clergyman named Savonarola had claimed that the church had become too secular. This is discussed in more detail in your textbook. The bonfire of the vanities was something that Savonarola had perpetuated in Florence, Italy. He declared that popes and prelates speak against pride and ambition, and they are plunged into it up to their ears. And he suggested a cleansing of such things, even to the point of book burning. This did not go over as well in Florence as he would have liked, since Florence had been the heart of the Italian Renaissance and the heart of new scholarship. The Pope is no longer a Christian, he claimed. He is an infidel, a heretic, and as such has ceased to be Pope. As we know, there were already thinkers, Christian humanists, as well as earlier men, like Wycliffe and Huss, who had, were influenced to make changes. Some of them, like Erasmus, were thinkers that were influenced by the Renaissance spirit of inquiry and skepticism, and they criticized the church. John Wycliffe has criticized the church earlier in the early uh, um, 1400s, as well as John Huss. But as we know, by the time we get to the early 1500s, Erasmus is one of the most notable Christian humanists that there is, with his book, Praise of Folly. The monarchy of Rome, as it is now, is the, a pestilence to Christendom, was a quote from Erasmus, wanting to urge the papacy to clean up its corruption. All of this is a precursor to the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, which begins with Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a German monk who started the Protestant Reformation. Protestant meaning that he protested church corruption and he demanded reform. In 1517, Luther published his 95 Theses, criticizing the sale of indulgences among other church corruptions. The church had started to sell indulgences, which was a way for them to accept payments to ensure salvation. Ultimately, what Luther had published in his 95 Theses, or his 95 Complaints Against the Roman Catholic Church, was that not only was there nothing in the Bible that preached that the uh, Catholic Church had power over determining who would go to heaven, which they had always claimed because of the seven sacraments, but he also claimed that the idea of purchasing an indulgence was completely uh, wrong. So, he published the 95 Theses, basically challenging some of the basic teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Even though he was a monk himself, he did not see a scriptural basis for some of these practices of the Roman Catholic Church. And since these practices were not based in scripture, 
as a humanist, he went to the source himself to find answers. He went to the scriptures. He argued that they were not valid. And this was what fostered his break with the Roman Catholic Church. He will pound the 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. A quote from Martin Luther says this, Why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of the holy love and of the dire need of the souls that are there? If he redeems a number of souls for the sake of miserable money with which to build a church. This is his comment about the selling of indulgences. What the selling of indulgences did was an indulgence allowed for a person's soul to not spend any time in purgatory and instead go straight to heaven. People could purchase this right for pe members of their family who had died or for themselves upon the, the moment of their own death. This money was supposed to go towards building a church for the Roman Catholic Church. In reality, most of this money went into the pockets of the priests who were collecting this money. Martin Luther recognized the corruption and he called the church out on it. Luther believed instead that faith alone is what secured salvation, that there were no good works that a person could do that could get them into heaven. Now remember, the Roman Catholic Church had considered that faith and good works were both essential for salvation, since they required that every person participate in the seven sacraments in order to receive salvation. What Luther was saying was that the scripture said that there, the just shall live by faith alone, and that the good works that people do are not to get them into heaven, but instead are a byproduct of their faith and of the grace that was given to them freely by God in exchange for their faith. Martin Luther wrote, these words, just and justice of God, were a thunderbolt to my conscience. I soon had the thought that God's justice ought to be the salvation of every believer. Therefore, it is God's justice which saves us. And these words became a sweeter message for me. This knowledge the Holy Spirit gave me on the privy in the tower. Luther denied the power of the clergy and the Pope with his 95 Theses. He believed that all Christians ultimately were equal and capable of interpreting the Bible themselves. In 1520, the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated Luther for his beliefs. He refused to recant because he said that his position could be buttressed or supported by the scripture. And the church could not prove that he was wrong based on scripture and reason. He's very much based in Christian humanism. Therefore, in 1521, at what was called the Diet of Worms, it was basically a council meeting in the city of Worms in Germany, he was declared an outlaw and his works were ultimately banned. So not only was he declared a religious heretic by the church, he was also declared an outlaw politically within the German Confederation of States. Martin Luther declared, unless I am convinced by the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in, in the Pope or in councils, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Luther's works will inspire the Protestant movements across Europe that split religious unity and weaken the Catholic Church. 
this would not have happened had it not been for the printing press that took his 95 theses or his 95 complaints against the Roman Catholic Church and translated them into many different languages and then dispersed them throughout Western Europe. The printing press is the tool that aided the spread of the Protestant Reformation. Without it, there would not have been a Protestant Reformation. Luther ultimately inspired massive rebellions in Germany. Peasants actually targeted the clergy and eventually the German nobility, their landlords, to try to get more rights for themselves. Now, Luther was not altogether happy about this because the German princes were actually the ones that were protecting him from being burned at the stake by the Roman Catholic authorities. He did not believe in a political revolution. Instead, he only believed in a religious revolution. Nine-tenths of the German people cry, Luther, the other tenth shout, death to the Pope. This is Harmonius Aleander, papal representative in Germany. Lutheranism became popular, however, more among the nobility and kings. This was finally those kings' opportunity to escape the power of the Pope, to wrench themselves from under the thumb of the Roman Catholic authorities. And Luther condemned attack on secular authorities as a result. This was a way also for those kings to finally centralize power around themselves at home, rather than being challenged by the nobility or by the clergy. Many forms of Protestantism will eventually emerge. Lutheranism was just the first one, as other forms of protest against the church occurred. So he opened up the floodgates for new Protestant movements. And that is why today we have the different denominations of Christianity that we never had before this. There was only one kind of Christianity in Western Europe prior to the Protestant Reformation. That was the Roman Catholic Church. After the Protestant Reformation, you had a mosaic of different kinds of Christian churches, different brands of Christianity, if you will. Another one following quick on the heels of Luther, another Protestant reformer, if you will, is John Calvin. He originally was French, but found it prudent to escape to Switzerland when the French king ultimately maintained his Catholicism and ran him out of the country. John Calvin will settle in Switzerland, in Geneva, Switzerland, and he believed ultimately that the religious leaders should control the state. Ultimately, Calvin will come to run the city of Geneva like a theocracy, where there is no separation of church and state. Calvin will differ from Luther on some points. Yes, he believed like Luther that faith is what justifies you, not good works. But he also believed that you were predetermined before you were born whether or not you were saved. Calvin believed that God predestined some for salvation and others for damnation. He called those that had been predetermined or predestination for the salvation as the elect. And he believed that those elect should rule society in order to glorify God. But how does one know if they're the elect or not? There's never a way to know for sure, he would argue. But if you did good things and you were successful in your business, perhaps those were outward signs that God had been smiling on you and that you were one of the elect. There was never any way to know for sure, but that could be an outward sign of your salvation. Calvin said, God preordained for his own glory and the display of his attributes of mercy and justice, a part of the human race without any merit of their own to eternal salvation, and another part in just punishment of their sin to eternal damnation. It was predetermined before you were even born whether or not you were going to be saved or not, in other words. 
Calvinism spread eventually from Switzerland back to France where he was originally from. He would develop a following there. Those French Calvinists would eventually become known as Huguenots or Huguenots. They were hunted mercilessly since France will remain a, an officially Catholic country. Calvinism will also spread to the Netherlands and eventually Scotland. The beginning of what is known as the Presbyterian Church is from the Scottish Calvinist Church. Calvin's tulip is a way to remember these important things from Calvinism. Total depravity, man cannot save himself. You, unconditional election, God chooses to save people unconditionally. L, limited atonement, the sacrifice of Jesus was for the purpose of saving the elect. I, irresistible grace, when God has chosen to save someone, he will. And P, perseverance of the saints, those people God chooses cannot lose their salvation no matter what they do. There was another group called Anabaptists who were a Protestant group who supported adult baptism, religious tolerance, and separation of church and state. They also allowed for women ministers. The Anabaptists were seen by many of the other Protestant groups as very radical especially by the idea that they only supported adult baptism, meaning that they did not believe that babies should ever be baptized, that you had to be of sound mind to make the decision yourself to follow Christ. In 1534, King Henry VIII of England of the Tudor dynasty will break from the Roman Catholic Church when the Pope refused to grant him an annulment or divorce from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. This is an example of a Protestant Reformation, the one in England, that took place largely because of political reasons rather than religious ones, like the previous Reformations that we've discussed in this lecture. This is a completely different motivation for why to break ties with the Roman Catholic Church. This will be discussed more in the next slide as well. But just so you know, Henry will eventually have six wives. Catherine of Aragon is the one that wouldn't give him a son or wasn't able to give him a son to survive infancy. She's the one that he wanted the annulment slash divorce from. Uh, he will then marry Anne Boleyn. She's the one who gives him the Princess Elizabeth. Uh, Catherine had given him the Princess Mary. The next wife, Jane Seymour is the one who finally gives him his son, Edward, Prince Edward. Uh, Anne of Cleves will be the, the fourth wife, Catherine Howard, the fifth, and Catherine Parr, the sixth. And there's a little rhyme about the six Henry's wives of Henry VIII. The first one's divorced, second one's beheaded, third one survived, fourth one divorced, fifth one beheaded, and the sixth one survived divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Okay, so Henry VIII of England. When it comes to the Reformation in England, we need to understand that Henry VIII will start this Protestant Reformation in England for completely political reasons rather than religious ones. Henry ultimately became the head of the Church of England, which was also known as the Anglican Church. That is the Protestant Church that will be created in England through the Act of Supremacy. He will do this because he was married to Catherine of Aragon of Spain, and although they had a child, they had a Princess Mary, a daughter, Princess Mary, uh, she was unable to give him a son that would survive infancy. And ultimately, because the Tudor dynasty was a fairly new dynasty, Henry was concerned about how long that dynasty would last if there would be contenders to the throne from other branches of the royal family if he did not have a secure male line 
for the succession. So because <clears throat> he wanted to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and the Pope refused to allow that divorce, ultimately this will lead a very Catholic Henry, by the way, to decide that politically he needed to break ties with the Roman Catholic Church, create a Protestant church in England with himself at the head of the church, then he could grant himself a divorce. This was the, what the Act of Supremacy was. It was Henry becoming the head of the Church of England, granting himself a divorce, and marrying the next wife that was in line, Anne Boleyn. Ultimately, he will also confiscate the church lands and the wealth throughout all of England. All of those lands that he confiscates from the church, he will then auction off to the highest bidder. This will allow him to have more money in the royal accounts with which he can raise armies, etc. And this will help him to become a more powerful and centralized king as well. This is all part of the same process that we'll be talking about in a later unit with the rise of absolute monarchies. But right now, we need to understand that not all of the reformations were religiously motivated. This particular reformation in England was motivated by politics. Now, his children, <clears throat> later on, as they become... Um, the, um, monarchs in England they will be the ones responsible for the spiritual reformation of the Church of England but Henry's sole purpose was so he could get uh, his male succession um, for the Tudor line the Anglican Church was a Protestant faith but it retained mostly Catholic practices and a clergy system without a pope though instead of the pope being at the head of the church the monarch was so the anglican church looked very similar to the roman catholic church and this ultimately will um, cause later generations in england to want to purify the church to make it less like catholicism and more like a real protestant church this will lead to the movement known as the puritans in England and of course as we know the Puritans are the ones the English colonists who come to America and start um, the beginnings of the colonies in Massachusetts and other places. Between 1450 and 1750 the power of the Catholic Church dramatically declined. They were challenged by Protestants as we've been discussing they were also challenged by more powerful kings that were able to limit the influence of the clergy in their countries, either by becoming Protestants themselves and no longer having to send any tithe money to the Roman Catholic authorities, confiscating those church lands, etc. But the Catholic Church was also um, challenged by new philosophers and new intellectual movements, uh, even the realm of science. We'll talk more specifically about the impact that science will have as we move into the 16th and 17th centuries with the scientific revolution. The Catholic Reformation and the Wars of Religion. The Catholic Church is not going to take all of these changes lying down. As a matter of fact, they are going to challenge Protestantism eventually. And this is going to launch what we sometimes call the Catholic Counter-Reformation because it is a counter-attack on the Protestant movement. It also is known as the Wars of Religion because there will be a few generations where religion, between Catholics and Protestants, religion is going to be the main motivating factor as to why people go to war. So... With this Catholic counter-reformation, the church will do two things. We call it a Catholic reformation in some cases because finally the Catholic church will start to reform some of the abuses that have been a problem for so long. But it is also a counter-attack on the Protestant church as well. So an attack on um, Protestantism as one of the heresies that the church continues to fight against. So, 
with the Catholic Reformation first, we see the church will so seek to finally revive its reputation and its membership. The Council of Trent was a meeting that was called between um, 1545 and 1563. Uh, a, not a continuous meeting that went on all, the, all that time, but <clears throat> they would meet several times each year. Uh, but the Council of Trent was this meeting of the church officials throughout Europe that were called upon to try to come up with policies that they could do, changes that they could make to try to strengthen the Catholic traditions as well as combating Protestantism at the same time. The Council defended Catholic beliefs, saying that faith alone was not enough to grant a person salvation, that they needed faith, yes, but they also needed to do good works to achieve salvation. They also, when they saw those good works as being the completion of the seven sacraments um, that they had established for all faithful. They also uh, believed in the veneration of saints. That means to recognize the saints as doing holy things and com um, being able to perform miracles and those kinds of things. Um, recognizing the importance of holy relics as well. Also reemphasizing the in disputability of the Pope's interpretation of the Bible, meaning the Roman Catholic Church's interpretation of the Bible. In other words, the recognition that the Pope has some kind of power over granting salvation to people. This, of course, was something that the Protestants did not accept, uh, believing that every believer should have their own ability, their own personal relationship with God uh, as their faith in that in God that gives them salvation so this is a completely you know basically an underscoring of the traditional doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church what it had always been but just re-emphasizing it in more strict terminology the council also sought however to clean up some of the church abuses that had been going on for so long they wanted an end to the abuse of power Ending things like pluralism, holding more than one church office. Ending simony, which was the purchasing of church offices. And it also forbade the sale of indulgences that I mentioned before was one of the reasons why um, Martin Luther broke from the church in the first place. <clears throat> the selling of indulgences of, you know, basically tickets out of purgatory for one's soul or one's loved one's soul uh, was no longer going to be a practice. However, granting an indulgence was something that the Roman Catholic Church reserved the right to do. You just couldn't pay for an indulgence. Uh, giving an indulgence, the clergy could still give someone an indulgence in exchange for you know, a holy work, a good work, those kinds of things, but they could no longer uh, grant an indulgence for um, cash. In the Counter-Reformation of, of this movement, the Counter-Reformation of the Church, the Church will respond forcefully to Protestantism. And this is where we start seeing the wars of religion come into play. They retained most of Southern Europe. Most of Southern Europe will remain Roman Catholic. They also retain Austria and Poland as Roman Catholic. We know that Russia will be Eastern Orthodox, kind of like the Byzantine Empire had been, uh, but lots of Northern Europe will be the ones that um, convert to Protestantism. Germany, England, uh, and well, Geneva, Switzerland, those kinds of places. France will be predominantly Catholic. It's an officially Catholic nation, although they will have pockets of Protestantism, those Huguenot Protestants. Uh, it was illegal to be Protestant in France during most of this time, uh, but uh, it will be, it's, it's not like they were able to stamp it out completely. Now, another <clears throat> part of the Catholic Counter-Reformation will be done by a man named Ignatius of Loyola. Ignatius of Loyola founded a new monastic order for the Roman Catholic Church called the Jesuit Order. It's also known as the Society of Jesus 
So anywhere you see Jesuit or Society of Jesus in your readings, you need to recognize that those are the same people. Okay, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, Loyola founded this religious order, this monastic order, specifically um, to fight Protestantism and to help spread Catholicism. Now, other monastic orders have been put in place to combat heresy. But in particular, the Jesuits would study the writings of Protestants, even though they would be illegal in Catholic countries. They were granted permission to study the uh, Protestant works so they could know their enemy. Uh, they were very learned individuals. They believed in education. And ultimately, by studying the Protestants and their writings, they would be able to better combat the Protestants. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. The Inquisition was another thing that was initiated, uh, or I guess it, we could say deepened, in the Catholic Counter-Reformation. The Inquisition investigated, judged, and punished, usually with torture and sometimes execution, heretics, and now it was not just, uh, you know, Muslims or Jews that were considered heretics. Now, of course, Protestants. Other, these are now fellow Christians, if you will, but they were the wrong brand of Christian, according to the Roman Catholic authorities. So these heretics, these Protestant heretics, could be put to death uh, if they refused to recant after being tortured. And a lot of this happened in, in places like Italy, the Roman Inquisition, um, of course, as also in Spain, the infamous Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was actually launched it was, um, by Queen Isabella of Spain, and um, eventually it would carry on for several generations. And they uh, targeted um, Protestants as well as Jews and Muslims in that Spanish Inquisition. Between 1517, at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, and 1648, during that time period, religious tensions between Protestants and Catholics will lead to a series of civil wars and conflicts throughout all of Europe. And this is why we call them the Wars of Religion. In the German provinces, there will be a lot of tension after Luther's Reformation began in 1517. As a matter of fact, since there was no united government in Germany, not really. I mean, there was a Holy Roman Emperor, but he was not really recognized by all of the German provinces as sovereign in their land. As a matter of fact, Germany was really made up of a bunch of smaller German principalities, and each prince had their own autonomy in their own um, city kingdoms, if you will, if their own little kingdoms. So what we see happening in Germany is that the northern provinces in Germany remain predominantly Lutheran. A lot of those German princes converted to Lutheranism so they could maintain control over the clergy in their um, territories. They didn't have to send the money to the Roman Catholic Church for the tithes. They could confiscate those church lands, and this, of course, was a way for them as the princes of those principalities to gain more power. In the southern half of Germany, because of their closer proximity to Italy in particular, um, most of those uh, principalities remained Catholic. So this caused a lot of tension between those German provinces, the northern ones being predominantly Lutheran, the southern ones being predominantly Catholic, a lot of inter, inter, inter fighting going on between those provinces. Uh, lots of civil strife, civil wars that continue to go on. Um, by 1555, however, there will be a kind of truce called between the fighting between the Catholics in the south, southern part of Germany and the Lutherans in the north um, through this Holy Roman Empire, which isn't really an empire. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, it ends with the Peace of Augsburg, where it is determined he who rules it will be his religion, which means that the prince in each of those principalities 
will determine what religion that principality will be. So if the German prince determines that his principality is going to be Lutheran, everybody there must convert to Lutheranism or leave. Same goes for those who chose to be Catholic. His region, his religion. Peace of Augsburg will end the religious warfare in Germany until 1618 when the Thirty Years' War occurs, which we'll talk more about in a later slide. In France, the wars of religion will go on between the officially Catholic nation of France and those pockets of Calvinists, French Calvinists, those Huguenots I talked about before, um, for uh, many generations. It will not be uh, settled until 1598. Now, for 36 years, there was strife between the Catholics and the Protestants in France. This will only be settled in 1598 with the Edict of Nantes. By this point, we have a new king on the throne. Okay, is Henry of Navarre. He becomes Henry the Fourth of France, and ultimately, uh, he will. He had been a Huguenot himself, by the way, but when he became the king of France, um, he will convert back to Catholicism in order to maintain peace in France because he recognized that the majority of the population was Catholic. So he converts to Catholicism, but he signs into law the Edict of Nantes, 1598, which declared that all of the Huguenots now, they can no longer be persecuted for being Protestant. In other words, the Edict of Nantes legalized Protestantism in France. You can no longer be persecuted for being a Protestant in France. This will grant them some religious toleration. This Edict of Nantes will last until Louis XIV comes to the throne and he revokes it with the Edict of Fontainebleau. We'll talk more about that in a later lecture. But just so you know, this will end the civil strife between Catholics and Protestants in France, at least for a time. Queen Elizabeth of England, she was the actual, she's actually the third uh, monarch after Henry VIII, the third child of Henry VIII to rule. It will start with Edward, who only rules for about six years because he was a sickly boy, never married. Uh, and then his oldest sister, Mary, who had been, um, you know, the daughter of the jilted wife, Catherine of Aragon, she was staunchly Catholic, tries to turn the clock back and make England Catholic again, which was a disaster. Um, she's ultimately called Bloody Mary because of her attempt to do so. She dies uh, without an heir. Uh, she had married the King of Spain. Um, they thought maybe she was going to have a baby, but she ends up dying, and it turns out she died of a, a huge ovarian tumor, so dies without an heir. And then, of course, the third child um, of Henry's to become uh, a monarch is Queen Elizabeth. She was the daughter of Anne Boleyn. Now, Elizabeth had been raised Protestant, uh, the Church of England, um, and as queen, she prevented war between Anglicans and Puritans who wanted pure Protestantism, who wanted to purify the Anglican Church, make it less Catholic light, if you will, and more like a true Protestant church. Uh, she managed to prevent war between these groups, however, um, uh, by signing into law certain measures that showed that she was kind of a Machiavellian herself. She recognized that um, they should be able to worship how they wanted to in their own homes, but she also recognized that the official religion of England would remain Anglicanism, uh, not Puritanism, and that everybody had to pay uh, an annual tax to the Anglican Church, regardless of whether they wanted to really worship like an Anglican at home. Ultimately, this will solve the religious crisis in her nation during her reign. There will be other troubles between the Anglicans and the Puritans later on with later monarchs, with the Stuart monarchs. 
um, which will be discussed in a later chapter as well. In 1618, there was a war that happened throughout Europe called the Thirty Years' War. Starts in 1618, lasts till 1648. This Thirty Years' War will be the last big war of religion in Europe. The last big showdown between Catholics and Protestants in England. Because eventually what happens with this war is it, uh, instead of it being a war between <clears throat> Catholics and Protestants through in the Holy Roman Empire, which is how it started. It other nations end up getting involved to try to bring down the power of the Holy Roman Empire. Ultimately, this will um, mean that there will be some Catholic nations supporting the Protestant cause because they don't want the Habsburg family that controls the Holy Roman Empire to have more power. And this means that they are using Machiavellian ideas instead of religion being the main motivating factor. They're doing it for balance of power. Pa po political agendas take precedence over religious agendas. By the end of this war, however, what we see happening is um, the peace of Westphalia ends that 30 years war and the powerful Catholic and Protestant nations that had been fighting against each other will finally have peace. From this point forward, most nations in Europe are not going to go to war over religion any longer. These nations instead, if they go to war, it's going to be about balance of power rather than religion. Religious tensions eventually eased with an acceptance of religious pluralism. Tensions led many to leave Europe for the Americas but there will eventually be a calming down of tensions with the recognition of, um, you know, Catholics and Protestants recognizing that each other has the right to exist. Unit 10, Age of Exploration and Global Interactions, audio lecture. We're going to start by talking about catalysts of the maritime voyages. Catalyst, of course, is what caused it to happen. Between 1095 and the 1200s, we know already from previous units that the Crusades fostered a renewed interest in goods from Asia and from the East, and this led Europeans to seek all water routes to Asia. A lot of this had to do with the fact that many were weary of paying the extra amount of um, money, taxes, etc., otherwise, that they had to pay um, for the uh, middlemen of the trade along the trade routes. <clears throat> Every time a good passed through a different person's hand, a different merchant's hands, of course, the price went up. So the whole idea behind this was to find direct water routes from a European nation to the east in order to cut out those middlemen. The Muslims controlled most of the trade in the area you see here. Europeans also sought gold, spices, new technologies that they could get from the East, and suitable lands to grow sugar and coffee. We'll see more about the lands that they want to acquire as we move forward. These were all items that were found outside of Europe that Europe the European nations wanted to get access to, but direct access rather than paying all those middlemen, especially the Muslim traders. Europeans believed that it was their duty also to spread Christianity to new lands that they came into contact with. They were competing with Islam in the South in places like Africa and in Southeast Asia. But as we know, they will also be complete competing between Catholics and Protestants uh, with new areas that they come into contact with, especially after they make contact with the New World. Newly designed ships like the Caravel that you see here, the Carrack, and the Flute were versatile and could carry large cargoes. 
we've talked about some of these kinds of new ships with new kinds of sails. These sails were uh, able to be maneuvered in a way that they could um, they could direct the ship in different directions um, and that aided them from getting blown off track or off route. They also were larger ships than we had seen before that could carry um, heavier loads. There is a flute. The caravel is the one in the center. It's the one that you probably are most familiar with seeing. Um, that was the kind of ship that Columbus will actually use. The, the three ships, the Santa Maria, the Nina, and the Pinta are all caravel ships. And of course, a Karak ship on the right. New ships used improved rudders, lateen sails, ones that could cut into the wind and could be maneuvered both side to side as well as up and down, and of course the cannon. All of these uh, were technologies that were transferred from Asia into Europe with the increased contact they had with the East due to the Crusades. All of these things have been introduced to the West. The compass, the astrolabe, also from Asia, both of which also from Asia, also um, allowed for uh, travel to be done easier. Also increased availability of maps, thanks to the printing press, also will help explorers. The Voyages of the Portuguese. In 1415, Prince Henry the Navigator organized voyages along the west coast of Africa seeking a water route to Asia. He was the crown prince of the small kingdom of Portugal, which is shown in red on the map. Portuguese established forts along Africa's western coast all the way down, um, eventually going around the Cape of Good Hope to get to the Indian Ocean and thus to India. All along in these western coast trading ports that they established, they will trade gold and slaves. Eventually in 1488, Bartholomew Diaz, Portuguese explorer, rounded the southern tip of Africa known as the Cape of Good Hope. Here's a map that was uh, done um, that's dated about the same time period, one that he may have used. As you can see, Africa does not look exactly like we see it now, but it's not too far off. At least the coastline is not too far off. By 1498, just 10 short years later, Vasco da Gama was able to go around that Cape of Good Hope and reach all the way to India, returning to Portugal with a cargo ship equaling 60 times the cost of the expedition. Talk about a payoff. By 1500, another Portuguese explorer, Pedro Cabral, accidentally discovered the coast of Brazil in South America by heading eastward. He thought that by heading eastward he would hit Asia, not really recognizing that there was a whole nother ocean um, as well as a whole nother uh, set of continents. Um, so anyways, he claimed this territory for Portugal. They never really knew during his lifetime what they had found. It would be later that it would be determined, oh, here are a whole new two set of continents that we didn't know about. There's the area that he covered. The Portuguese were not conquerors, but instead they built trade forts designed to control the trade routes of the areas that they wanted to contact. This is why we do not refer to the Portuguese empire as a colonial empire because they did not establish colonies where they sent people to live. Instead, we call the Portuguese Empire a trading post empire because instead of colonies, they established trading posts, most of which were not very heavily manned by Portuguese. Um, instead, uh, they were traders only and small, small portions of people 
going there. The Portuguese ended the monopoly of Venice, Genoa, and the Muslims that they all had on trade with Asia as a result of these new trade routes they established. And this will finally put Portugal as a kingdom on the map, meaning making them a world power on the um, world stage with other European nations. Alfonso de Albuquerque, who was a Portuguese explorer, said, if we take this trade away from them, meaning the Muslims, Cairo and Mecca will be entirely ruined, and Venice will receive no spices unless her merchants go to buy them in Portugal. In other words, Portugal would benefit by cutting out those middlemen, the Muslim middlemen as well as the Italian middlemen. The center of European trade shifted then from the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. The Portuguese port of Lisbon, therefore, would be very prosperous. Now let's talk about the voyages of Columbus. Christopher Columbus was from Genoa, Italy. Using maps of ancient Greek, the ancient Greek Ptolemy, he concluded that sailing westward to Asia was actually going to be faster than going eastward. Now, he was not the first person to attempt this sailing westward. We talked about an earlier Portuguese explorer doing that same thing and ending up in uh, Brazil, but not realizing that. So Christopher Columbus's idea needed to be funded, however, and he himself did not have the funding um, and he could not get the Genoese government, which was a republic, to fund the expedition. So he began to look elsewhere. Ptolemy, who was a, a Roman times um, uh, scientist and uh, map maker, had estimated the Earth's circumference to be around 16,000 miles, which is about 9,000 miles too short from what it actually is. So in 1485, Columbus uh, started to uh, shop his idea around to different countries throughout Europe to try to get funding for his expedition. He finally came to Spain and he asked King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella to fund his exhibition. Queen Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, Queen Isabella had just recently united um, their smaller kingdoms of Castile and Aragon to form a united kingdom of Spain. Um, and they were interested in putting Spain um, on the map, if you will, as a major mover and shaker as a world power. And they already had their smaller neighbor kingdom, Portugal, to compete with. So they were interested in funding this expedition. Ultimately, as many of you already know, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue for Spain. Spain fully funded Columbus's voyage west, and this newly unified Spain that was eager to compete with Portugal was now becoming quickly a world power. Columbus thought he had reached Asia, but he had landed instead in the Caribbean, a new world, if you will. Columbus ultimately settled the Caribbean islands and ultimately enslaved the inhabitants there. This complicates Columbus's historical legacy to this day. A quote from Christopher Columbus with his first encounter with what he called the Indians, thinking he had reached India. They brought us parrots and balls of cotton and spears and many other things, which they exchanged for the glass beads and bells. They willingly traded everything they owned. They were well built with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and do not know them, for I showed them a sword. They took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane. They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we can subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Columbus's four voyages propelled Spain to the forefront of European exploration, 
conquest and settlement. Spain's empire will be a colonial empire. That is different than Portuguese trading post empire. Spain will send Spaniards to the areas and colonize them. The Voyages of Other Europeans Portugal and Spain dominated the early years of exploration. In 1494, Spain and Portugal signed a treaty called the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Pope had created what was called a line of demarcation, separating Spanish and Portuguese parts of the world, parts that they were allowed to explore. Everything to the east of the line would be for Portuguese, Portugal to explore, and everything to the west of the line would be for Spain to explore. And if you look at this line of demarcation, you see it includes Brazil in the territories that Portugal is allowed to explore. That's because they had already landed there. It, uh, the rest of it is for Spain. Now in 1494, this was just two short years after Columbus landed in um, what would eventually become known as the West Indies or the Caribbean. He didn't really know what he had at that point. The Spanish didn't know how large the territory would be that they would be allowed to explore all of those two continents of North and South America. They initially thought that they got kind of the short end of the stick, if you will, and that Portugal got the lion's share. But within about a generation, it was very quickly realized with more Spanish explorers heading westward that there was a whole new world out there to explore and discover and to exploit. Portugal and Spain continued to expand, but emerging maritime powers like France, England, and the Dutch Republic also began exploring as we moved deeper into the 1500s and the 1600s. By 1497, another Italian named John Cabot explored the northeast coast of North America. He did this for England. In other words, England funded the expedition. In 1499, another Italian, sponsored by Spain, Amerigo Vespucci, mapped and described the New World. And Amer the Americas are actually named after him. Amerigo Americas, North and South. There's Amerigo Vespucci, and there's some of the Native Americans that he came into contact with. And there's cannibalism going on in the background. Here is a uh, passage from Amerigo Vespucci. In past days, I wrote very fully to you of my return from new countries, which have been found and explored with the ships. And it is lawful to call it a new world because none of these countries were known to our ancestors and all who hear about them will be entirely new. For the opinion of the ancients was that the greater part of the world to the south was not land but only sea, which they have called the Atlantic. And even if they have affirmed that any continent is there, they have been given many reasons for denying it is inhabited. But this opinion is false and entirely opposed to the truth. My last voyage has proved it, for I have found a continent in that southern part full of animals and more populous than our Europe or Asia or Africa and even more temperate and pleasant than any other region known to us. In 1519, Ferdinand Magellan, sponsored by Spain, organized the first voyage to circumnavigate the earth. Now that is a 50 cent word for you folks. Circumnavigate just means to sail around the world, like the circumference of a circle. Circumnavigate is circling around the earth. Magellan sailed around from Spain, going southward, going around 
the southern tip of South America, across through the Pacific Ocean, an entire ocean that they didn't really know existed before a couple of years before his voyage, Balboa was the one who discovered the Pacific. As he continued on, he went to the Philippines. He died in the Philippines, but one of his ships and 17 of his men were able to make it from the Philippines all the way back to Spain. So Magellan is given credit for the circumnavigation of the globe, even though it was technically just one of his ships that made it back. By the way, it is rumored that he probably was eaten by the Philippines. Um, they were not happy about his arrival. In 1534 to 1541, a man named Jacques Cartier from France pushed into North America and further explored the areas up there. Using information that he received from earlier explorers like John Cabot, who had uh, sailed for England, he pushed deeper and explored the St. Lawrence River in Canada. In the early 1600s, the Dutch East India Company expelled the Portuguese from many of their East Indian ports, gaining control over the spice trade from that region as a result. Now, if you look at this map, the Dutch Republic is the small green territory right above where France is located in the northern part of the map. All of the territories along the southern coast, the southern tip of Africa, as well as the southern tip of India, and all those other island areas in light green are what they will eventually gain control over. They call it the Spice Islands or the Spice Regions, and they gain control over these areas, taking them away from the Portuguese. Eventually, the Dust West India Company is established and it will establish outposts all throughout Africa, even into Spanish colonial areas, and in North America, those things that you see in the dark green um, in North and South America. The Spanish in the Americas. With a combination of guns, germs, and steel, the Spanish conquered the natives of Mesoamerica and South America. Spanish conquests in the New World were led by individuals called conquistadors, which basically means conqueror. They were seeking gold, glory, and religious converts. They oftentimes, their motives are oftentimes nicknamed gold, glory, and God, the three G's, the motivating factors behind the conquistadors from Spain. These conquistadors are different than the explorers because they, their idea was to conquer the inhabitants of the regions rather than just explore the area. Probably one of the most infamous of the conquistadors is the conquistador Hernan Cortez. In 1519, he left Cuba that had become a center of operations for the Spanish in the New World. He left that area and sailed westward to present-day Mexico. He was initially greeted by the Aztec Emperor Montezuma, who mistakenly thought he was sent by the gods and that he perhaps was a god himself. Ultimately, by 1521, just a couple short years later, utilizing the divisions within the Aztec Empire, which we've talked about before, uh, especially those uh, territories that were tired of having to pay tribute to the Aztecs who were rebelling against their authority using divide and conquer, uh, but also the Spanish using a smallpox outbreak, which of course is a European disease that they brought to the New World um, as carriers, maybe asymptomatic carriers, but bringing that to the new world and these new world populations had no immunities built up to these diseases because they had never had those diseases before. Using those things uh, and despite the Aztec rebellion, 
Cortez was able to take the city of Tenochtitlan and conquer the Aztecs. He had a few hundred men and some horses, and he conquered thousands and thousands of natives. The disease was probably the most handy of the things that he had at his disposal to help him conquer the territory. Pictures showing the defeat of the Aztecs. We also need to note that in 1532, the Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro captured the Incan emperor Atahulpa at the Battle of Camjaraca, ultimately causing the end of the Incan Empire. Pizarro promised the emperor's release after capturing him if the Inca filled rooms with gold. The Inca delivered the gold, but the Spanish murdered the emperor anyways. In 1540, after a prolonged rebellion, the Spanish finally were able to take control over the Inca Empire. Now, most of South America will belong to Spain. After conquests over the Aztecs and the Incas, the most powerful Native American tribes, the Spanish took over parts of North and South America. If you look here, everything in red was considered part of the Spanish Empire, even those parts in Europe. As I said before, the Spanish had a colonial empire, and so they had to establish a system of governing this colonial empire. Spain set up four vice royalties in its American territories. Vice roys are basically vice kings, roy meaning king. Um, they act as the governors on behalf of the king of Spain in these territories that they conquered. So there will be four, four vice royalties in the New World. The vice royalty of New Spain would be located in North America. The vice royalty of New Granada would be the um, northern tip of South America. The vice royalty of Peru is in Peru. And the vice royalty of La Plata is the southern portion of South America. That easternmost portion of South America would still be in the um, control of the Portuguese since they had landed there first. And this is why, still to this day in South America, the majority of South America speaks Spanish, but Brazil speaks Portuguese. Spain converted many of the Native Americans to Catholicism because Spain if you remember from the previous unit, was a Catholic country. And they made them Spanish subjects, forcing Catholic conversion, um, seeing this as a way to win souls for the Catholic Church. This also would um, help them to get more Catholic believers than they had lost to the Protestant Reformation in Europe. If you look here, a social hierarchy, a social pyramid developed called the Casta system, and it formed based, based largely on skin color, and still remnants of it remain in Latin America to this very day. The way that they, it was organized was that the Peninsulares were at the top. They were people that were born and raised in Spain who had come over and settled in the New World. The Creoles were a combination, sorry, let me go to this slide. The Peninsulares, like I said, were born in Spain, and the Creoles were Spaniards, full-blooded Spaniards, so they had two Spanish parents, but they were born in the New World. Okay, so the Peninsulares were the ones that were born in Spain and transferred over. The Creoles were uh, children of two Spanish parents, full-blooded Spanish, but born in the New World. And they will all, those, those two groups that were pure Spanish blood, both, dominated politics and the economy in the New World. The Spaniards often 
<clears throat> took the Amerindian or African wives, few Spanish women, and their children had middle level status in the caste system. The children of a Spaniard and an, uh, a native Amerindian or an African when they started importing slaves over uh, were known as mestizos or mulattoes. Mestizos were the ones that were half Spanish and half Amerindian. The mulattoes were half Spanish and half black. The mestizos, European Indian mix, the Zambu, the African Indian mix, and the mulatto, the European African mix, populations will soar in the coming century. From a Spanish man and an Indian woman, a mestizo is produced. From a black man and an Indian woman, a Zambu is produced. From a black man and a Spanish woman, a mulatto is produced. Amerindian or increasingly African slaves fill the lowest ranks of the caste system. Native Indians and black slaves that were imported over from Africa. Competition for North America. In addition to Spain, the Netherlands, France, and England all claimed lands in North America. You can see the division here looking at this map. Most profitable North American colonies were located, however, in the Caribbean to the south of Florida. Here in the Caribbean, sugar plantations and trade were prevalent, um, and the Caribbean was largely dominated by Spain. The Spanish colonies located in the southeast and the southwest of present-day U.S. focused on trade, the search for gold, and the spread of Catholicism. The earliest North American settlement was right down the street from us here in St. Augustine, named after St. Augustine, the Catholic saint from the third century AD, or sorry, the fourth century AD. The Dutch will organize joint stock companies to allow investors, businessmen, to share the risks and rewards of funding an expedition to the New World. They focused on profit rather than religion. The primary motive was to gain access to trade rather than to convert. In 1624, the Dutch West India Company established New Netherland with its capital of New Amsterdam. Eventually, they will lose control over this settlement to the British, who will rename New Amsterdam New York City. The English were late in colonization efforts compared to others. They had some internal conflicts going on at home that kept that from happening sooner. They struggled, therefore, in establishing a colony in North America, had several failed attempts before finally achieving one at Jamestown. As we see here, in 1607, the Virginia Company, which was a joint stock company, founded Jamestown in Virginia. That will be the earliest British settlement in the New World. In 1620, the Puritans will sail and settle Massachusetts, landing at Plymouth, Plymouth Rock. In 1664, the English took New Netherland, solidifying control of the Atlantic coast of North America. They focused on profit, not on missionary work. The English colonies, as they were established, engaged, engaged in a, different, a mixture of different kinds of uh, economic avenues. In New England, it was mostly trade. In the middle colonies, it was mostly farming. And in the southern colonies, it was a different kind of farming, a farming of cash crops. 
that could be utilized then to be uh, raw material to be brought back to England to be converted into manufactured goods then sold to others as products manufactured products uh, things like tobacco and sugar and cotton trade in New England farming in middle colonies and cash crops in southern colonies population remember Florida still belonged to Spain at this point the French also were late to the to colonize North America but eventually they would journey over establishing Nova Scotia in 1604 and Quebec in 1607 in Canada about the same time as Jamestown was being established by the British in Virginia the French like the Portuguese and the Spanish converted natives to Catholicism and then established profitable fur trade with the native population Cardinal Armand Richelieu in 1627 wrote the descendants of the French who are accustomed to this country New France as it would be called together with all the Indians who will be brought to the knowledge of the faith and will profess it shall be deemed and renowned natural Frenchmen and as such may come to live in France when they want just as true French subjects without being required to take letters of declaration of naturalization this would never really fully come to fruition however the Colombian exchange now let's talk about economics European exploration beginning with Columbus that's why it's called the Columbian exchange led to the emergence of a global economy for the first time in history through sea trade this global trade known as the Columbian exchange included the global diffusion of agricultural products from the old world to the new world and from the new world to the old world uh, as well as animals diseases and humans the new world had products that had never been seen before in Europe products like potato corn tomatoes tobacco peanuts vanilla chocolate hello turkeys and diseases like syphilis these things will make their way to the old world introduction of horses from the old world to the new world will change the cultures of almost every Native American group prior to the introduction of European horses there was uh, that the Buffalo hunt was not as big of a deal for the Native Americans in North and South America as it will be when they become more mobile with the horse the Colombian exchange decimated Native American populations however 90% of the Native American population in North and South America will die of disease many different European diseases but in particular smallpox will be especially devastating the Amerindian depopulation created a huge open space for Europeans to now conquer and settle the area with little resistance the old world had things like coffee sugar wheat rice cows horses pigs sheep goats chickens and of course diseases like smallpox measles and diphtheria the European colonists and the African slaves that went to the New World brought these diseases and goods with them new crops from the New World moving into the Old World will revolutionize the Eurasian diets leading to unprecedented population growth more food 
equals more people, remember. And many of the goods coming from the new world into the old world were easy to grow in the old world um, soil, things like potatoes and corn, and they were highly caloric, meaning many calories, that could help to stave off famine and starvation that had been a problem in Europe for centuries. Sugar plantations along with gold and silver coming from the New World also enriched Spain as well as the rest of Europe at the expense of the native populations in the New World. The Atlantic Economy the Atlantic world included the economic interaction of North and South America, Africa, and Europe across the Atlantic Ocean. England, France, Spain, and the Dutch held Caribbean islands with sugar plantations and they competed with each other in the global market. The precious metals of Latin America were also very profitable. Atlantic, the Atlantic coast of North America was not nearly as profitable with these kinds of things as Central and South America or, or the Caribbean. The triangle trade developed, named for the triangular sailing pattern across the Atlantic connecting Europe, Africa, and the Americas. You can look at this and see what things were shipped in which direction. American sugar, rum, cod were all shipped to Europe in exchange for silver, then shipped to Africa for slaves. Then the slaves sent to the Americas to replace the decimated native populations that had been lost as a workforce because of the diseases of the Europeans. The African slaves seem to have immunities to the European diseases that the native populations in the Americas did not. European nations developed econ an economic system called mercantilism, relying on their colonies as sources of raw materials as well as new markets for trade. This will help to build up big nation states and help the kings of Europe who had been trying to build up and centralize their authority, breaking the back of the feudal system as well as breaking the uh, influence of the Roman Catholic clergy easier. The nation states of Europe will eventually be born. The more modern idea of a nation state that we still have to this day was born due to this mercantilism. And of course, mercantilism was born due to colonial expansion in the age of exploration. Mercantilist policies ultimately benefit the mother country most. It forces colonies to produce raw materials for the mother country and forces them also to consume goods that were originated within the empire. The whole idea was to maximize the amount of wealth coming into the mother country, minimize the amount of wealth going out, but also to sell as much as they possibly could, which also maximized wealth coming into one's country. All of this new wealth in Europe will lead to new world labor systems and as mentioned earlier, the slave trade. We're going to discuss more about that as we move through this section of the notes. The Spanish conquistadors adopted the Inca system of forced labor called the Mita for the gold and silver mines that had been established in that area. They will continue to use this, uh, many natives continuing to be worked to death as a result. The Spanish and the Portuguese used what was called the encomienda system, where they 
used the Native Americans as forced labor on large plantations of cash crops, like the sugar plantations in the Caribbean. Settlers believed that they owned the natives that lived on their large land grants. They were granted the land from the monarchs, the King of Portugal or the King of Spain, and they believed that everything on that land, including the people, belonged to them. This forced labor and tribute from the natives was also something that they um, expected on a regular basis. Juan de Sepulveda argued the barbaric traditions of the Indians, sacrifice, cannibalism, sexual freedom, justified enslaving them. Now remember folks, just because something is different than your idea of what's good does not necessarily mean that it is bad to those people. So it's hard sometimes for us to not judge another culture by our own culture. <clears throat> Sepulveda said, those whose condition is such that their function is the use of their bodies and nothing better can be expected of them. <clears throat> those, I say, are slaves of nature. It is better for them to be ruled thus. Natives are as children to parents, as women are to men, as cruel people are from mild people. Native Americans died in great numbers from the working conditions that they were subjected to, as well as to disease. So the Mita and Ecomienda systems were unsustainable as a result. In 1542, Spain banned the use of Native Americans as slaves because of works from people like Bartolomé de las Casas, who had urged more humane treatment of Amerindians. And I quote from one of his books, The reason the Christians have murdered on such a vast scale is purely and simply greed. The land is fertile and rich, the inhabitants simple, forbearing, and submissive. The Spaniards have shown not the slightest consideration for these people, treating them, and I speak from first-hand experience, having been there from the outset, not as brute animals, so much as piles of dung in the middle of the road. They have had as little concern for their souls as for their bodies. All the millions that perished having gone to their deaths with no knowledge of God, one fact in all this is widely known and beyond dispute. The indigenous peoples never did the Europeans any harm whatever. On the contrary, they believed them to have descended from the heavens, at least until they or their fellow citizens had tasted at the hands of these oppressors a diet of robbery, murder, violence, and all other manner of trials and tribulations. He was an outspoken critic of what was widely accepted in European society. Good for him. However, the failure of the Mita and Ecomienda systems due to the widespread deaths among the native populations, remember, like 90% of them died of diseases, led to the need for a new workforce. And this will lead to the use of African slaves being imported in. Primarily, this happened in Latin America initially. Indentured servants would be brought to North America from many of the Northern European territories. Indentured servants were to work a certain amount of time. Um, and, and once that time was up, they were free. Slaves, of course, were purchased as slaves as chattel for life. Slaves were, brought, were bought and sold as chattel or property, and African kingdoms were eager to trade slaves for goods with Europeans as part of the triangular trade. The African economies focused on transatlantic tra slave trade, leading to the demise of several trans-Saharan gold and salt trade, as we discussed in an earlier unit. 
we will see that the gold salt trade becomes less important to the kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, and instead the more lucrative slave trade takes over. Conflict increased in West Africa with militaristic states conquering and enslaving people from smaller states, Africans enslaving other Africans. A slave fortress on Africa's slave coast is here. They would then sell the slaves to the Portuguese or to the Spanish that would then import them to the New World. Eventually, the Spanish um, will bring them to North America and the English will also participate in the slave trade, the English and the French. The gun and slave cycle, as it's sometimes known, saw African states trade slaves to Europeans for guns so they could then use them to conquer more of their rival tribes and get more slaves to sell to the Europeans even more. This perpetuated the slave trade. In 1650, the Akan people of West Africa's Gold Coast united to form the Kingdom of Ashanti. Ashanti dominated the gold and slave trade in the region for quite some time. The kingdoms of Dome, oh sorry, Daome, West Coast, West of West Gold Coast, and Benin on the Slave Coast also were major slave trade partners with the Europeans. The African diaspora, as it's called, which is the spread of mostly African men to the Americas, led to depopulation in Africa and the weakening of patriarchy in those areas. African slaves brought to the New World were brought on ships and this journey was known as the Middle Passage. It was first used by the Portuguese and then used by the Spanish, the Dutch, the English, and the French. It was called the Middle Passage because it was the middle part of that triangular trade. African slaves were brought to the New World working the sugar plantations of Brazil and the Caribbean. And the life expectancy for many of these slaves was about three years. The work was so treacherous, the terrain was so awful, the weather was so terrible, and the treatment was so poor. Coming over on the Middle Passage, the survival rate was something like 50% because the journey was so treacherous. So if you add those two um, statistics together, you see a high death rate among slaves coming to the New World. Not because of diseases, because they were immune to those, but because of other harsh treatment and overwork. Sugar plantations used mostly male slaves. There were few African families that, were, that came over. But tobacco and cotton plantations in North America also used women. Eventually, more women would be brought over from Africa. The English colonies in North America relied on indentured servants primarily from the British Isles and from Germany initially. Eventually, indentured servitude proved to be more expensive than buying slaves that you had and owned for their lifespan. Indentured servants signed legal agreements promising years of work in exchange for their transatlantic voyage for a new life. Once they served that time, they were free. It's not the same as slavery. At the end of the servitude, the indentured servitude, usually about seven years, the indentured servant, assuming they had survived, was free of obligations to their master. 